Welcome everybody. We've got Randall Kuna and Keith Wiley here today. We're going to be discussing whole brain emulation and mind uploading. Randall is the founder of Carpet Copies. He's a computational neuroscientist and has written a lot of papers. And Keith Wiley is um, an advisor to the Brain Preservation Foundation. He's also on the board of Carbon Copies and the author of A Taxonomy and Metaphysics of Mind Uploading. And also the author of the more recent novel, uh, Contemplating Oblivion, which we did a, re a recent interview about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, part of the field called connectomics. So um, the discipline that tries to acquire images of the brain, any brain, animal brain, human brain, insect brain, whichever brain, and to do so at the resolution of an electron microscope. In the future, there are other methods we can talk about, but right now it's electron microscopy. And to do so at high throughput, which means so fast that you can collect all of the slices, all of the images from, say, a mouse within an amount of time that is reasonable for a project. So some number of years. Agreed. Well, what are some future directions do you think? Cause you mentioned at the moment, there's a, you, you know, Oh, there there's a, there's a lot of buzz just future. now about this thing called expansion microscopy, which is really a light microscopy method, but applied to brain tissue that has first been expanded with a hydrogel. And uh, at, because you expand it first, then things that you normally could not resolve with light microscopy become visible. And that means you can use a technology that allows you to apply stains that can help you see and identify and tag which types of cells you're looking at, and at the same time acquire the images. So that's very useful. Uh, it speeds up the process of being able to identify what you're looking at in those uh, images. The trick there is that you can't take a picture of something smaller than the wavelength of light you're using. And the neural features that are important are in fact smaller than visible light. So the expansion technique literally balloons everything up to a larger size, uh, hopefully to within the range where the wavelengths of light can then capture these critical features. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, once you've captured these critical fe features, what do you do with them? That's a really Nicole. good question. And that's actually, I'd say, yeah. where, where we're stuck, kind of. <laughs> because right now, typically what you do is you, uh, you stitch it all together again so that you don't have individual images, but you have the entire image stack. And then you apply some really smart machine learning um, and machine algorithms, but also human annotation to it and trace what's in there. Try to identify the cells, identify what types of synapses are probably there in their ion channels and that kind of thing. Um, but okay, then you have that. That's still a static image with some identified features. What you'd really like to do is you'd like to take that and you'd like to transform that back into what it came from, something that, that operates on information. You know, the brain works with information and you want to recreate that. So you want to get the neural circuits back out. You want to be able to reconstruct what was there. And that part has received relatively little attention so far. Some interesting attempts have been made. Um, for example, Philip Shu tried to functionalize the uh, connectome of Drosophila, but that's the fruit fly. Um, but the method, I mean, we could get into detail there, but the method that he used is one where you could say, okay, he did the easiest possible thing you could do there. He still got some very interesting results, but it's not like an actual reconstruction of the fruit fly brain. And similarly, there are some attempts to do really small reconstructions of pieces there, but a really large scale attempt hasn't yet been, I'd say, maybe even attempted and certainly not successful. Right. So it's been a while since um, I've actually directly interviewed you. Uh, I think you came and did a talk, I think it was 2013 in Australia and Melbourne for a, uh, a Singularity Summit then, or was it a Science Technology Future by then? I don't remember. Yeah, also, but it's been a while. Really yeah, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it too. And we did a few interviews while you were down. Yeah, good days. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, has there been much progress in AI-assisted uh, 
neuroscience, which might, I guess, make it easier for you to, I guess, image parts of the brain that were more difficult to interpret. Yeah, in there's the a great team at Google, led yeah. by Veer and Jane, that does a lot of work on um, AI assisted or machine learning assistant. Um, I guess the segmentation and and tracing part of uh, of that whole task. I think I'll actually hand this one over to Keith for more yeah. because I think you probably know a little bit more about that angle. Um, yeah, we're we're uh, critically dependent on these machine learning algorithms that are uh, really incredibly performant now. Uh, so we are using, um, as Randall alluded, these machine learning algorithms that were originally developed at Google. And uh, what comes off of the EM um, microscope is, you know, many, many, many images, which are these Z-axis slices through the brain, where each image is a grayscale, there's no color, it's a grayscale image of a cross-section of what's called the neural pill. So you get these uh, neuron bodies just sliced in half, and you get axons and dendrites just, you know, just sort of weaving through the volume at strange angles. So most of them look kind of like the cross-section of a straw, but they can be kind of elongated if you're sort of slicing slightly through, you know, through the elongated axis. And then there's all sorts of other stuff in there. There's astrocytes and glia that just, and, and blood vessels that just make a whole mess of it. And, you know, the question when you look at these images is how do you segment the pixels into sort of meaningful physiological boundaries, basically cell walls more than anything else. How do you actually define the cell walls of everything smashed together in there? There isn't much space between the cell walls because it's actually, it's actually a solid, um, you know, one thing that the public may not appreciate is we often see these depictions of neurology where there's like, there's a neuron here and a neuron there, and they look like these sort of spiders that are very distinct. And you think it's all very airy and spacious in there. That is not what it, it is, a crammed solid volume of goop, and there's no space in between anything. So this is what you end up with cross sections of. And we need to almost perfectly segment essentially along the cell walls to find the boundaries of the neurons, the boundaries of the astrocytes, the boundaries of the glia, the boundaries of the things that aren't any of those things like the, the, uh, the blood vessels. Um, we define those boundaries essentially, and this is called segmentation. Segmenting an image is basically labeling every single pixel in the image as some sort of unique class where the class might be this neuron or that neuron. You, you segment the whole image. So a segmented image often looks like um, a color splash against the image where no pixel isn't colored. So you got a purple patch and a green patch and a red patch, things like that. Um, we need to be able to do this automatically because if we want to scan even small sections of a brain, much less whole brains, um, the sheer quantity of data to go through is just beyond manual work. It has to be done in an automated fashion if we're ever going to achieve our goals. And that's what Google has mm. made significant progress in. Um, we're using what's called machine learning. You know, machine learning has been one of these sort of revolutions of the last 30 years where instead of programming the intelligence of a task in, instead, you feed labeled data into an algorithm that basically statistically learns the patterns of the data. And it, it, it learns how to then classify that data. And we have been sufficiently successful in that that we can actually do this very well. We can take these very messy images of a slice of a brain and ask the machine learning algorithms to segment it, basically to find the boundaries of the cells. And it does a remarkably good job. Um, so that that's that's sort of the. I don't know if it that help, one, but if you it. want, I don't know if it helps to visualize. And I, it so happens because I just had a presentation handy recently. If you want to see an example of the yeah, sort of I was I was hoping we had something to show. This is all fly brain. This is uh, Janelia stuff. Let me try to show that again. Um, I'll just go back a little bit so that you can see the different. Scales here. Yeah. So we're we're zooming in on the neuro pill on the left there. This is from the the fruit fly, and on the right you can kind of see the result. This is after tracing and and putting it all. Is that a whole in. brain on the That's right? That's the whole fruit fly brain. Yes. Hmm. And how big would that be? Just is it the size of like a crumb, or you know, 
Oh, I think the fly hey. is the size of a crumb. <laughs> yeah, it's whole fry. Whole fly is the size of a crumb. That's right. Yeah, it's tiny, tiny. Yeah. Would you say uh, like fruit, a, fruit flies don't look like a sesame flies. seed? Yeah. Uh, well, fruit flies. Because bees have like a brain the size of a sesame seed or something like that. Is it similar with a fruit fly? Would you say? Um, a, a fruit fly is made bees are much larger and have them. many, many more neurons. Bees have millions of neurons. Fruit fly only has two hundred thousand. Oh, so it's yeah. very different scale. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is beautiful imagery, by the way. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, they did a great job over there. Um, do you really have, did. A, do you have an example of a color coded segmented single slice that would really illustrate the point? Color coded segmented single slice, um, not as easily available as this because I don't happen to have it in a recent presentation where I know exactly how to find it. I'm sure it's there somewhere if we need it. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but one thing I, let's see if it helps. Um, but yeah, on the left here, you're seeing an example yeah. of what you would see when you take an image with an electron microscope. And uh, some of the circular bodies in here are cut-throughs of cell bodies, but others are just sort of the intersection of uh, an, a dendrite or an axon piece that is traveling in the Z direction, that's traveling into your screen. And then when you have to reconstruct, when you're trying to find out what connects to what, and you want that whole connectome, you need to put all these images on top of one another so that you can follow them back up by following the outlines and knowing what connects to what, what belongs where tracing it back and then you can infer all sorts of things from where in the brain is it what does the cell look like uh, are there certain features that are unique to a certain type of cell or a type of synapse uh, by looking at its structure uh, when you zoom in to the highest resolution you can see the so-called postsynaptic densities so you can get some glimmer of an impression of the the strength sort of the size of the connection between an axon and a dendrite and so therefore the weight of that connection and yeah on the right there that image this is um this is basically an example of the end result after you've done all that tracing and reconstructing so that you can trace it from one cell you can trace the connections from one cell to another and then if like philip Shu, you decide that you want to functionalize you could say okay i'm going to use an integrate and fire model or some other model for every neuron and then i'll just put some activity on them and see what happens as that activity travels down. And that's a really rough uh, simulation of what might happen in a piece of the brain. It's it's certainly not the end result and what we're looking for, but it's uh, it's kind of a first attempt that he made there. But yeah, I think uh, Keith, you have a you have something uh, yeah. else for us now, don't you? Uh, this is a paper from Nature that I just sort of found on Google that sort of illustrates my point which is that, um, you know, on the, in the upper left, again, as Randall showed, this is just a, a native um, electron microscope image, um, I think. Uh, so you can sort of see the boundaries of the cell walls, and then there are some features inside them. If, I, if I'm correct, those darker bodies are actually mitochondria and things like that. And then um, the algorithm I was trying to describe earlier sort of reveals the image in the upper right, where all the sort of conceptual boundaries and then the things inside them get uh, you know, sort of uniquely identified as distinct objects, which is to say primarily cells. So mostly neurons and things of that nature. And that was the whole point that Randall and I have been trying to make is that these algorithms are now able to automatically do this for each of these images, um, which is, you know, a crucial step. And then, um, Here's another, the, I'm not entirely sure what the, the picture on the right is some sort of functional model, but the picture on the left again shows the point we're trying to make. So you have these layers upon layers upon layers of EM images, which conceptually form this grayscale volume, a three-dimensional block of voxels, where a voxel is a three-dimensional pixel. And then sort of against the face there, again, you can see the, the segmentation where each individual slice can be sort of turned into a bunch of sort of amorphous blobs, but we are then able to trace these carefully through the stack of images and produce these three-dimensional models of the neurons, where of course, you know, a neuron basically looks like a tree. Um, there's a cell body called a soma, and then there's a whole bunch of branching 
segments sticking out of it. The vast majority of them are dendrites, and then sort of one of them with its own branching structure is an axon. We have ways of identifying those primarily based on the sort of distribution or count of synapses. Um, axons tend to have a different distribution than dendrites. Um, and you get this, you get this sort of, um, uh, sort of snarled web of neurons. And again, to my earlier point, this is only showing some of the neurons. The, this whole volume is actually solid axon neuron, axon neuro, uh, dendrite mess with the occasional cell body or the occasional astrocyte, but it is not this airy fluff of trees. It is a solid mass. And yeah. that's what we're trying to reconstruct, not only structurally, but of course, we want to create a functional model of how this whole thing works. Um, so I'm just going to yeah, share when that. You see, sorry, but when you see, uh, say, images of either artificial neural networks or even reconstructed networks, very often you'll see this very sparse structure that you're seeing on the left over there. And that's because on purpose, only a few of the cells are being shown or all, only a few of the cells have been transfected if it's some kind of optical microscopy. Um, and that's uh, either because you couldn't transfect them all in that case or because you didn't want to. And here for the purpose of display, but of course the brain doesn't actually waste space. So it's quite crammed in there. Wow, yeah. Um, is Google in um, going to continue development of this algorithmic technology to help uh, identify areas of the cells or the, the, the neurons and such? Is this a, an ongoing project which they're improving? Yeah, there, there are multiple institutions working on it. Google's working in collaboration with others. And um, not only will they, but they have to. Um, these algorithms are incredibly impressive, and they are also, I don't think, are good enough for the sort of you know, true whole brain emulation that we imagine needing. The, 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 the error rate on a much larger data set, such as a whole brain, would require so much manual repair that it would be tedious. But the same thing is, you know, the amazing thing about machine learning is the more data you get into it, the better it gets. So the more data we pull off of our EM microscopes uh, that we can feed in on the training side, the better these segmentation and labelers will get. So the path to automating that, I think, is pretty clean. Um, and I think Randall sort of made a good point of the really hard problem, which I, I, I think we're going to solve this problem of like how to actually get the data. Um, what we need to figure out is how to turn that into a meaningful functional model of how signals propagate through the neurons. And that's, you know, that's the next big thing. Um, you know, one thing to point out that mm. will sort of help us learn how to do that is um, we can attempt to solve that problem based on pure structural features. Uh, for example, we know a lot about a synapse from these EM images. We actually know the sizes, not of the neurons, but of the individual synapses. And the, the size of a synapse is generally the surface area of contact between uh, you know, the, the two neurons that are in contact there, things of that nature, or the volume of the, the synaptic cleft. But we are also running experiments, these are mostly mouse experiments, where we train the mouse to perform a, you know, a, a behavior. We gather um, in vivo spiking recorded signals uh, from the neurons while the mouse is learning and performing this behavior. And then that exact same mouse uh, is the mouse who is, of course, euthanized. And then that section of that brain is scanned. So what we get is the very, very high resolution structural arrangement of the neurons, but we also have functional spiking data of how those neurons performed basically when the mouse was alive. And we have a combination of structural and functional data. And, and this is going to take us in the direction of learning how we won't be able to do this all the time for everything, right? When we want to perform whole brain mm. emulation or mind uploading or whatever of a human, we're not going to be able to get perfect functional data of every neuron and every synapse of a person and then do the structural scan. That's not going to work. But what we will do is 
learn how to read the structural data to obtain the functional model, because we can use sort of the experiments I just described that will guide us toward that. We will say, well, here's the functional model of a little piece of a uh, brain, and here's the structure of that same piece. We can learn how to deduce the function from the structure, and then we will be able to multiply that across the whole brain. Yes, Randall, mm -hmm. you agree? Uh, yes, I do, and and that really gets to kind of the crux of the matter. If you want to do this translation from structure to function, if you want to be able to functionalize your model, you need ways to to improve your methods to the point where it works very well, and that means you need to have really good criteria, very good metrics, and data sets that give you what you might call the ground truth so that you can really correlate these two things, function and structure, and learn how to make that translation happen correctly. And because, as Keith already pointed out, that's very difficult. Oh, hey, there's Kitty. Um, he pointed out that that is, uh, it is really difficult when you get into larger brains with more volume, uh, and especially ones where it's, it's difficult, for example, to use methods like um, calcium or voltage imaging, but instead you, you'd have to stick in electrodes to get data. Um, some, some researchers or some labs have decided that they want to try very small models as ground truth models. And, and by model, I mean animal models. So animals that are manageable in that sense. And by manageable, I mean animals where when you're trying to capture that functional data that you can then co-register with the structural data, that you have some confidence that as you've watched that functional data, these, this, you've observed the activity in the system, that you're actually capturing the activity that you should see in the system for all of its behaviors, or very, or almost all of its behaviors. Because a problem if you're, if you're doing this co-registration is that if you're looking at a, a temporally limited stretch of time when you've recorded from some subset of cells or maybe all of the neurons, you don't know that you've seen all the possible functional activity that you could observe mm. if you're dealing with a larger animal, especially not if you're only looking at a, a subset of the cells or only a few regions because you can't even get somewhere quite easily. So for instance, the, uh, the courting lab at UPenn decided to focus on the nematode C. elegans, which has often come up in this context of connectomics. Um, we can talk about why it may also not be a great model, but it has at least that one thing going for it. C. elegans, that nematode, does not have too many different behaviors. It has a small range of behaviors, and you can observe everything that's going on over its lifetime. So you have a good chance of capturing much of what's going on behaviorally and in terms of activity, and then you can co-register that with the connectome that you know plus what you've measured about the individual functions, the, the typical characteristic functions of the individual cells, which is another story in C. elegans because those cells are all quite unique because there are only something like 302 in the male C. elegans. And, um, and, and they, they function almost like individual brain regions in the human. Plus they don't typically spike, they talk to each other through an analog set of subthreshold activities. And that's then the critique is that it's not a great example of the sorts of brains we should be learning with because it's so different. But at least it's an example where you can try out, okay, how would I learn? How would I try to make algorithms that can carry out this structure to function transition or where I can at least come up in the end with a proof of concept of one thing that has been fully emulated, even if it isn't you know, a mammalian brain or something that approximates a mammalian brain the way that a fruit fly would, in the sense that a fruit fly at least has different areas of the brain doing different things and has populations of neurons that work together and create patterns, which is really not something you see in C. elegans. Hmm. So, um, I guess Google uh, don't have a, like a, um, a mind upload sort of a milestone. Maybe they do behind the scenes, but I haven't heard them talking about uploading minds yet. But their purpose converges with 
um, carbon copies in the sense that because you wanted to achieve mind uploading, they also want to achieve whole brain emulation. But what are they doing it for? W what are their reasons? Is this just to understand how um, the human brain works so as to inform AI development? Or is it um, to help with medicine or a bunch of things? Yeah, there are much more practical applications. Um, basically, if we can figure out a lot of these fundamental things about them, how the brain works, then things as um, you know profound as Alzheimer's will become uh, you know subject of tremendous advances. So you don't have to be a futurist looking for mind uploading to see the um, you know incredible value in making huge steps forward in learning how the brain works essentially. Um, so. Uh, I mean, that's, that's why uh, they're really just yeah. trying to help advance fundamental neuroscience and the, you know, the much more sort of ordinary uh, medical advances that would, that will come from that. Mm -hmm. I would also say that it's really a, a paradigm shift in how neuroscience is conducted. Um, so for example, back in November at the last neuroscience conference in Washington, I would say that 95% of all of the posters on the poster floor, and there are a lot of posters, it's, there are something like 30,000 neuroscientists that go there. 95% of those are still working with what I would call the traditional neuroscience approach that is a very correlational approach. So you've observed something, you have a model in mind, a hypothesis. A model is really just a mathematical expression of a hypothesis. So you have some idea of what's going on somewhere in the brain then you set up an experiment where you carry out some manipulation, like for example, an animal that learns something or uh, a foot shock that you give them or something like that. And you have an idea of, okay, these neurons here are going to respond in a certain way. And then you try to verify if that's true or not. And then you can either falsify your hypothesis and then make some corrections and updates, or you can show and, that it works that way and publish something. Um, of course, you should publish something as well. If it doesn't work, that's very important. Um, but that's, I would call that correlational neuroscience. And I know that's not an official term for it, but that's really what the traditional neuroscientific approach is. Um, and what we've seen there, um, just a gathering of less than 200 scientists, uh, actually at the meeting we created for this, there was only 80 there. Um, this was something uh, that the Brain Preservation Foundation together with Carbon Copies organized an event there that was about uh, a prize to do work um, aimed at being able to extract a non-trivial memory from the connectome. And this was all about connectomics. So about this gathering of the data and then reconstructing neural circuits. The group of people there are practicing a different kind of neuroscience in the sense that it's really about reconstructing the circuits. And therefore, if you're saying, for example, I'm identifying a memory, what you're really identifying is the retrieval mechanism for a memory. Because memory itself, a certain pattern of spikes, doesn't mean anything without context. You need to have the retrieval mechanism. And so in the same way, you can imagine that as you go forth and you build these models more, what you get is a science where you can follow activity from the input, from sensory input, like auditory, visual, whatever you have, what have you. You can follow it through the system and see what's happening to it. And what we call thoughts, what are they actually? What's happening in there? How are drives impacting that? How are the memories that you have impacting it? So these associations you've made with whatever input is coming in, and how does that work its way out towards behavior? So you get a complete cascade of what's happening in there. And that's a real mechanistic explanation of what's happening in the brain. And yes, that is also, of course, what the more correlational, as I'm calling it, approach is trying to strive towards. But the new tools and new methods are making it possible to actually come up with these kinds of explanations. So I would say that really is a paradigm change, and you're going to see more and more of neuroscience turn towards that, I think. I mean, you know, you don't have to be some radical futurist to see the value in just sort of learning how the brain works. So this is just called basic research or fundamental research. You know, a lot of science just comes down to learning the next sort of chapter in science and not having, you know, a clear sort of, you know, uh, 
notion of some exploitable practical goal that you're going for. Um, uh, this is actually a problem in our society. Uh, some people, some political parties, uh, some politicians are sometimes, you know, complaining that it's, it's not clear what the actual sort of, you know, value is of some incredibly abstruse mm -hmm. research project. And, uh, you know, that, that's the amazing thing about science is that if you just, if you just continue the centuries long quest to learn how the natural world works, the, you know, the financial projects that will come out of it, you know, that could just come later. Uh, there's just value in gaining an ever improving understanding of nature. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, just doing fundamental research on, in science has its own value that's not always easy to sort of pinpoint a financial mm -hmm. reason for it, but you just do it and then new things, new possibilities come into focus and then people start thinking about how to make money. I was going to say the vast majority <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. of sort of, you know, great leaps forward have been serendipitous. Um, you know, it's, it's often some surprising result that uh, you know leads to some advance that wasn't foreseen now, that's actually the normal way for things to happen which is why you know i i really think that there should just be a societal interest in just learning stuff yeah. and 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 then realizing that the rest yeah of uh, like a societal curiosity that just keeps yeah. keeps it digging also... away at the unknown Sorry, Randall. It, it seems sometimes as if there's a larger, I don't know, there's more pressure uh, on some areas of science to to show the practical application quickly than others. And that can be a situation that I get a little bit jealous about from time to time. So, for example, in particle physics, you don't very often get the push of, okay, so what is the next practical application of the Large Hadron Collider. You know, you put billions of dollars into that. And what application are we going to make? That's just not well, it's good for smashing things, right? Yeah, so in neuroscience, that same principle should apply, first of all. But even then, of oh, course, smash. there are there are things you could imagine. And Keith was already talking about applications to diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. But if you're able to reconstruct neural circuitry, Another obvious thing that comes to mind is something like neuroprosthetics, neuroprosthesis, the mm. replacement of parts of the brain when people have brain damage. Mm. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you want to talk more about that? That's fascinating. And like, I, I'm pretty sure we have discussed that many moons ago, but where, um, I don't know if there's been much in terms of development, the better uh, Elon Musk has got his uh, um, brain can computer interfaces, the Neuralink going, and I'm sure there's some other things. But what's, what do you see is the, the future of uh, neuroprostheses? Well, I obviously no, not, think there yeah. is a future for neuroprosthesis. Um, I'm not exactly sure how much progress has been made since I was last involved with it, um, mm. because I haven't really kept up with that as closely. So. I was involved with it very closely when we were doing uh, Kernel, a startup in LA that was all about trying to work with USC to do a hippocampal prosthesis until Kernel decided to turn a different direction and do a non-invasive diagnostic device. Um, but the lab that we were working with at the time, of course, kept on doing what it was doing. And although the professor uh, in charge, Ted Berger, he's had to step back a bit for health reasons. Um, his uh, his former postdoc, now professor there, Dong Song, has continued unabated to carry on experiments where they were showing that, in fact, that their model has an effect on uh, improving human memory. And uh, because they identified certain parts of the problem that were really major technical hurdles, especially the problem of recording activity deep in the brain. Um, most of the recording devices, for example, the ones that uh, Neuralink makes, are meant for the cortical layer. They're really surface electrodes. But uh, what you need if you're going to work in the hippocampus is you need something that goes deep into the brain. 
and there the electrodes had very few recording sites. So you could only record from a few neurons at a time and stimulate a few neurons at a time. And that's not good enough to really replace the input-output function of that portion of the hippocampus that they're trying to replace. So they went and uh, got a big grant to develop, together with the foundry, uh, to develop new uh, probes, or new uh, neural recording devices. And that, from what I know, is what most of the recent publications there, aside from their modeling publications, have really been about. Although I believe they also still do experiments uh, with human patients. And uh, yeah, we'll see what comes out of that. But I, like I said, I, I haven't kept up with that as much because I've really turned all of my attention towards the connectome-based approaches at this time. Nice. Keith, you got anything to add there? Uh, I can't say that I have been... Uh, I, don't, I don't really know exactly what's going on in um, prosthes prosthesis and... Um, uh, just brain, brain computer interfaces in general, you know, obviously the one everybody hears about all the time is Neuralink, but, uh, there's a lot of other work going on out there. Um, one of the, it's a rather, I think it's a rather broad spectrum technology, but one of the greater success stories is the, uh, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's. But, you know, this is, you know, this is what we call early 21st century sort of applications. And, you know, I think the interesting story that, uh, you know, to keep our eyes on is the fact that as we learn more and more about how the brain works, just the opportunities to, you know, build the next generation of these prostheses and, and just sort of these um, sort of invasive, that's not meant to be a pejorative term, these, these, these are physically sort of neurologically invasive tools that can sort of get into the critical parts of the brain that are salient to any sort of uh, uh, degradation and um, and then offer improvements to it. And then, sorry, that's a big fluffy tail here. And then, you know, the we, we often try to sort of sell a lot of this in terms of how it's going to cure diseases or, you know, otherwise make up for and recover from losses of the natural functionality and that's where we're that's you know we're only trying to get back to just a normal healthy human but then it's a it's always some sort of moral conundrum as to whether or not there should have be any interest in going beyond that should we only try to just recover the losses but just maintain the same human species that we have been for two hundred thousand years or is it morally justifiable and fascinating and interesting and, and, and motivating to ask the question, once we have the ability to create these kinds of um, prostheses that you know, sort of penetrate into the brain and let us you know, interact with them with, from a computer and uh, modulate and modify the firing patterns of neurons and of suites of neurons and whole regions of the brain, can we do something of an augmentary, augmentation fashion. Can we actually do something that goes beyond just recovering the natural human form? Can we, can we, can we turn the default number of things that you can remember from seven to eight? Yeah, you know, just, just like what, what would be the tiniest increment that would be, you know, a step up instead of just medical recovery? You know, um, I'm just. And I do think it can be baby steps. It doesn't have to be some big, scary story that, get, that sort of gets the public afraid. What if we could remember on average eight things instead of seven? Like, like there, are also, there are probably a ton of things like that all over the brain. There are just sort of opportunities for very unscary ways that we could do a little bit more than we've been doing for the last 200,000 years. And we will have those opportunities and I think it will be interesting. And, um, you know, I, ju I just don't think that people should be afraid of that. Yeah, well, that's fascinating. Yeah, I agree. Baby steps, um, I'd love to have a better memory. It'd just be so convenient, you know, it's a, just so many times I've forgotten people's names or... Just like, I'm just sort of daydreaming about sort of things I wish I could do better. 
some people are better at learning certain kinds of things than others. Some people just pick up second languages, you know, much more easily. And some people have a profoundly hard time. I've, I've always had a very hard time learning second languages. If we figure out even 1% of how the neural circuit of learning actually works, um, we may be able to offer, you know, sort of anyone the, the ability to just sort of take in and learn information a little bit more effectively. Um, how profoundly fantastic would that be? I mean, it's just, mm. you know, this is what the future will almost certainly deliver. I don't know when that future is, and I never get into that prediction game. I'm not one of these people who's trying to pick, you know, a decade on the map where I think certain milestones will be met. I just refuse to play that game. Mm. But I do think that it is essentially inevitable that these things are, are going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking as you were saying that, um, it reminds me of like a lot of, there's a lot of confusion about how people learn today. Um, and there's, you know, uh, what, and back a game that people can apparently play. And some studies say that it helps improve short term memory. Uh, and there's a bunch of other sort of brain games that are touted as working, but you know, um, we just, there's, there's no conclusive research it seems, but if we had this means of being able to sort of track uh, what was going on as people were doing specific mental tasks and yep. seeing how that actually bolstered, you know, um, progress in brain formations relating to memory, relating to learning, relating to different types of memory, episodic memory, short-term memory, and all those sorts of things, then we'd have more of a keen understanding of what's actually doing, what's actually really working, and more of a grounded understanding, and what isn't. Uh, yeah, yeah that some would be of this, great. Some of this was actually, these were the topics of discussions at Kernel when we were still working with the USC team at the time. Because, mm -hmm. um, for example, when you give a patient an implant that is supposed to support their damaged hippocampus, now you have a device that is always on and is there recording and stimulating as they're doing things. Now you can try to simply get up to the level that their, you know, their ability to acquire new episodic memory was at before. But at the same time, you can do things like have the device just store all the patterns that it sees coming through and then help you train each one of those patterns or apply some different filter than your brain normally would apply to it to pick the, the patterns that you want to keep training. So the hippocampal learning that eventually is offloaded into other parts of the brain mostly takes place during this phase called slow wave sleep, also happening mm -hmm. during quiet periods when you're awake. And there's a particular pattern of activity that happens and that is a replay, sometimes forward, sometimes backwards of the patterns that you've seen in the same sequence. Now you could totally just drive that. You can stimulate the neurons to do the same thing. So you could choose to make that learning more formidable, or you could choose that these patients can selectively go through the patterns, reactivate some, realize what that was connected to, say, I don't want that memory, or I do want that memory, and then purposely choose which ones to keep. So suddenly you have a capability that you didn't have before. So these patients would in a sense become superhuman. And then the question is, if these patients are so good at that, if they're getting a benefit out of it, are people who are not patients who don't have a defective hippocampus going to want the same implant? I mean, these are the sorts of things that, of course, Elon Musk isn't even shy about. You know, he talks about how Neuralink right now is working with um, paraplegic patients and, and, and that sort of thing. But they, or was it a, I don't know if it was a locked-in patient or paraplegic, I don't remember anymore. But in any case, they're working with patients who have um, motor problems. They can't really, you know, move their bodies anymore. And uh, in future, of course, he would like this to be not just something that you use with patients, but something that, that BCI is something everybody could use in some sense, right? And then there are all sorts of interesting additional questions we could talk about where you get into the more deeper questions like, okay, so how far can BCI actually help someone who is fully healthy um, what sort of a high bandwidth IO connection can you actually establish with the brain that is useful 
that is better than, say, for example, the high bandwidth input connection through the eyes. Mm. Maybe we can get a better output connection. Or are there other ways to properly interpret what's going on in the brain to translate what you're putting in there or train the brain to use the information? I don't know what would happen if you have mm. those probes. So um, I guess then, yeah, it's kind of an experimental question. But for those of us who are really interested in this topic of neuroprosthesis and then eventually brain emulation, you know, we were already kind of thinking ahead and thinking, well, obviously there are limitations to all of that. So for instance, in BCI, the big limitation is that even if your outside devices are very fast, then all of the information that you're putting into the brain through these new input connections that you've made, they're running into cells that can only fire at some maximum speed. So mm -hmm. you're just, you can parallelize, but you can't really speed up the cells. So there's going to be a limit there. It's also interesting to Keith's question about how could you have eight instead of seven items in working memory. And it's, you know, it's usually, there are some parts of the brain, some types of working memory where it's called seven plus or minus two. And then there are other types of working memory where it's five plus or minus one, but it's, um, it's limited by very intrinsic things about the brain, such as, for example, the type of interneuron that's involved with recurrent inhibition and how quickly it shuts off a pattern of activity and then how long it takes for that shut off to go away for the activity in the brain to recover to the point where where pyramidal neurons these excitatory neurons can fire again and so that only gives you a certain number of intervals that you have time for within this rhythm that is really the rhythm that is always there when you're using working memory that theta rhythm so in that theta rhythm that's about 120 milliseconds only in the upper part of that, in the phase where it's positive, can you use it for retrieval. And in that part, you have room for about seven plus or minus two or five plus or minus one of these recurrent inhibition phases. So how do you change that? How do you go up to eight? You really have to change the cells themselves. So yeah, those are topics. Yeah, well, that's fascinating. I was speaking to a friend in Beijing when I was there and we we're talking about different ways to sort of augment the brain and we thought of, well, you know how like a, a message being sent um, across the network from, you know, where I am in Victoria, maybe to the top of Australia would take less time than a message being sent from one side of the brain to the other. Seems as though this corpus coliseum or coliseum um, is rather slow. It's small. Uh, and there's these two big chunks on either side connected by this puny sort of networking device right in the middle. Well, more to the point, a, it, I'm not sure if that's a good characterization. Well, more to the point, the individual spikes are just traveling. Yeah. Rather. So, so even, even if it's myelinated, you know, to your analogy, you, know, you, you, can, you can send a signal sort of, you know, through the internet faster than it can sort of traverse the brain. Um, which is kind yeah. of interesting. Yeah. I've always thought that, um, you know, mm. one of the most interesting stories about how memory works, this was something I kind of came across on my own, although I'm sure many people have, have sort of discovered it, is that when you want to remember something briefly, like you want to, you're in one room and you want to carry some memorized piece of information with you for 30 seconds into the other room, there is this uh, trick where as you're, as you're sort of trying to hold this thing in your memory for a short period of time, you actually verbally will say it out loud to yourself, right? Now, there can be a number of theories as to why mm. that helps you remember something. Maybe it's the act of saying it or the act of sort of the memory. But, but another thing which I have found is that it really matters whether or not you're actually saying the thing out loud merely voicing it quietly or even moving your mouth doesn't have the same effect, which means that the memory uh, enhancing effect is not the sort of cognitive like recreation of the event. It's not even the physiological like motion of your mouth. It is this trick where your brain is trying to communicate from one part of the brain to the other, basically the part that says, I need to remember this so it's trying to get it over to the part that's going to need to remember it. It could just send the signals through the axons over there. But instead, we make 
noise into the air. That noise travels from our mouth around to our ear, goes in through the auditory cortex, gets thoroughly processed through that entire system, ends back up in the brain as this processed audio, which gets turned into you know, sort of words and whatever. And that circuit helps us remember something in a way that we're not able to do completely inside our own brains. And I just think that that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever like encountered. <laughs> How on earth? I mean, of course, you know, in an evolutionary <laughs> perspective, you know, so evolution just, I mean, evolution, you know, found this solution to a problem, you know, from a, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes perfect sense. But if you were you, designing a brain, this Keith, is ridiculous. Do you know if someone, do you know if someone has studied this, like comparing people who are deaf with people who are not deaf and their ability to no. hold things in memory? That's, I, I've never looked into it. It's a fascinating question. Yeah, I don't know. But I just, it, it occurred to me once. Maybe they could our brain do things with their hands, with right? Yeah. As they yeah. move, go from one room to the other. Yeah. Signal themselves. I don't know. I, I don't know. I just think it's mm. weird that the brain communicates with itself by literally talking to itself, literally talking to itself. I think it's just a fascinating thing. Does that work with long-term memory? I mean, can we can we uh, entrench things that we want to know in long-term memory by these little sort of hacks, by vocalizing something? Let's just say you're going to do a talk or something, and there's things that you know you're not going to remember very well because you don't think about them every day. Can you repeat them to yourself? Does that work? I mean, I should let Randall speak some. It's there's a lot of research in tend to practice talks. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of research into things about memory. Frankly, I know very little of it, but, um, you know, one of the well-recognized sort of memory tricks is this, this concept of a memory palace where some people, mm -hmm. people have a different degree of spatial and visual embedding within their own sort of neurological experience. There are people who can't form images within their head, minds at all, for example. I am profoundly visual and, and not only visual in terms of images, but, but sort of three dimensionally spatial, you know, I'm, I'm always sort of hanging little bits of information in like a visualized, like three dimensional space. It, it's, it's sort of strange. So there's, I'm not going to go off on this tangent too long, but, but, you know, to your point, there's a lot of very interesting research into how memory works and to your question into techniques we have learned that people can perform in order to assist their memory, such as the memory palace technique or repeating something to yourself. Um, I should let Randall speak for a moment. I'm curious what your thoughts are on just sort of what, what is the effect on memory of just going over something over and over again. And that kind of, you know, that just sort of keeps the mem that just sort of warms up the memory circuits or stuff so that they don't kind of fade out from the situation or I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on this? I'm, I'm not someone who's studied that specifically. So memory tricks, at least from a psychological point of view, right? Um, I, there are a lot of things that come to mind that would be helpful. So if you're repeating something, um, one of those things is simply that you're paying attention to it because attention is usually number one in being able to remember things an upregulation of cells, making it more likely that they will fire or will achieve re retreat will, um, propagate information and then encode it. Um, so that's one thing. And then of course, repetition, because a single pattern to pattern activity isn't enough to strengthen a synapse. It's not even enough to establish LTP, this chemical strengthening of synapses. You can't, which is why it's absolutely certain that working memory is not a chemical process, but an electrical process. It's this looping of information. Whether that is done through an actual loop, a circuit of cells, or if it's done by an intrinsic loop, which is this process of having activity, then decay, and then this thing called ADP, that's after depolarization, where cells come back up and they refire the pattern they've seen before, which is typical of pyramidal neurons throughout the neocortex. And the whole neocortex can then support that kind of reactivation of patterns. So 
in any case, to remember something, you need to repeat patterns. And you want to repeat them in the right order because that gives you causality. That gives you what comes before what. It also makes it possible to establish heterosociativity. So not just associativity in the sense that a number of neurons together establish one pattern, but that they connect to the next pattern and the next pattern and the next pattern. So there are all these things you have to do. And that's why one of the features you see, for example, in, in episodic memory learning is that you get the reactivation of the same patterns in the same order during this slow wave sleep cycle so that you have many opportunities to go through the same cycle and that will eventually allow the synapses to establish LTP, long-term potentiation, so that they'll be more strongly connected in that chemical process. And then eventually you get actual changes in the synapses themselves in terms of their orientation, their size, maybe even the number of synapses. Um, so there's, there are a lot of different stages in the way memory is established, which also means that there are a lot of different filters, a lot of places at which a pattern that might have made it into memory doesn't make it into memory for some reason or other. And then you can imagine that the ones that receive more attention, that for example, you actually come across more often in real life, maybe because you saw the car two times, or maybe because you repeated something to yourself, would have a higher chance of getting through those filters and would actually end up in your memory. So I can imagine that those things matter. And you can even see that there's real evidence that um, this process of slow wave sleep, that that is involved in your setting up actual memory that lasts, so intermediate term or long term memory, because uh, there's a, been a long tradition of telling students that if you don't just want to learn to get through the test and then forget everything you've learned, but you really want to remember and understand what you're doing, you need to learn it at least six days in advance, which mm. gives you just enough time for that process to take place. Mm. So I don't know very much about that field because again, I didn't study it from the sort of cognitive science psychology aspect, but I can see a lot of reasons why this sort of thing would help. That's fascinating. You've got a keyboard behind you. Yeah. Um, do you, I'm not sure what kind of stuff you like to play, but, um, I'm, I've, Getting back into the keyboard, I used to play uh, a little bit when I was a kid, but I've got a keyboard now and I have a go and I'm trying to work out some stuff. Often I just try and do it as quickly as possible and play as fast as I can, but that's not very good for learning. It's not, a, it's not the fastest way to learn and also you end up being a messy player. So I wonder if there's any correlations there in, in, in the way, like if you're trying to learn a classical piece, um, if you do it slowly and episodically, without, I don't read sheet music, I just listen to it and work it out. Is that, would this apply? Is there any ways that you've tried to think about how to learn how to play keyboard better with your neuroscience background? Not specifically, <laughs> because I mostly use the keyboard now for composing rather than for playing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was both a violinist and a piano player uh, in my childhood and got relatively good at it, actually. Um, wow. And yeah, so if you're really trying to learn that, I mean, it, it's not even at the point where you're trying to learn a piece of music and trying to figure out, you know, episodically what comes when and the timing of everything, but you're trying to train your fingers to be able to make those, yes. those moves, yeah. those patterns just right. And so there's a lot there that is at a deeper level. There are so many different stages you have to build up and learn up towards. Uh, until you get to, oh, here, I've got all my skills and all I have to do is sit down and learn this piece of sheet music, which is really kind of at the top of the pyramid there. Is that actually mm -hmm. in the cerebellum, Randall? I know I know that all the motion control is in the cerebellum, but when we... The motor stuff is largely yeah, like, cerebellum, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so when you, when you basically become, when I, I play piano too, when we became, you know, extremely adept to playing a particular piece of music, so it becomes muscle memory. That encoding is basically being sort of, uh, sort of burned into those synaptic connections of the cerebellum. Is that correct? And just in case it isn't obvious to everybody, the cerebellum is like this little thing at the bottom of your brain back here that looks like another small brain attached to the bigger brain. And it contains 70% of all your neurons. Yeah. Mm. So it has almost all the neurons. In that cortical part. 
And then the other fascinating thing is that even though it has most of the neurons, they are not wired the right way for consciousness. So you can, if a person were to lose their cerebellum, their sense of conscious experience would be almost completely unaffected. Sort of a fascinating thing about yeah, yeah, that reminds me that there is a project to make a prosthetic cerebellum. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Is the cerebellum the, uh, the ancient brain? Did we, did our ancestors only have a cerebellum? Oh, I think you're thinking state? of, you're thinking of the, um, medulla? The limbic system, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. So the, the really deep parts of the brain, uh, the limbic system, so-called, which also kind of sticks down into your neck. That's yeah. the oldest part of the brain. And mm. also the first one that evolved, that develops when you're, you're, you know, you're a baby and you have this neural tube that starts to form into the various parts of your brain. The cerebellum is also relatively old. You can find a cerebellum in most animals. Um, whereas the cortex, and especially the prefrontal cortex is much newer. Um, but, um, but yeah, that, that limbic system, it's interesting how many very important parts of the brain that we use now for high level things are actually in there. So for instance, the deep hippocampal system is also down in there and it's, it gets repurposed in some ways. So, you know, when it was first being studied, uh, for example, in rats and in mice, it was thought of as the place where, well, I'm using the word place already, pun intended, uh, that, uh, that does places. It, uh, you know, it's a memory for places and things like that. So then people found place cells there and in the medial temporal lobes that are attached to that, uh, these cells that, that fire when the mouse is in a specific place. So it's mapping out the environment. Now that's definitely not the only thing that it does. So for example, it also responds to whisker activity and all that sort of thing. But, um, but we know that the same area in humans is used for things that have absolutely nothing to do with place. I mean, we also use it for place, but we use it mm. for almost any kind of context. So it's almost a place where you can store context cues along any sort of virtual dimension that you can map out in a sense. That's it's fascinating. Part that, it's part of that much older piece of the brain that is it's very just being repurposed with the cortical part of the brain, the modern part of the brain, and totally essential. Yeah. I would say evolutionarily, that's not too for, for things that we would consider very conscious things. Sorry. Yeah. Both the, I think I, I spoke over you. Both the limbic system and the cerebellum, the fact that they've been around forever uh, doesn't surprise me because, you know, dinosaurs and all the amphibians that predated the dinosaurs and all the fish that predated them and the trilobites, you know, the need to coordinate motion or in the case of the hippocampus, the need to basically take in information from the environment and form memories out of it. I mean, that's got to go pretty much back to the beginning. I'm not, I'm not actually too surprised that that's been around for a long time and has, you know, stabilized, um, yeah, the cortex is sort of the, the thing that sort of sprung up out of the primates that, that really became really interesting. You mentioned um, consciousness, uh, the, or parts of the brain that um, compute consciousness. You didn't use the word compute. But um, what parts of the brain are mostly associated with consciousness? And has there been any interesting developments in this area over the recent years? Oof, I don't know. I think the thalamus has actually been implicated. Randall? So this is controversial and troublesome. Hmm. There are some parts of the brain that are highly correlated with conscious activity and that are implicated strongly in certain conscious acts and conscious behavior. But there isn't really any part of the brain that is known. Well, I mean, there are parts of the brain you can damage and you'll still be conscious. But of the, say, cortical regions, the higher function portions of the brain, there isn't. You can't just say, oh, this part's not involved or that part's not involved. Um, I, I'll go out on a limb here. So I, I don't want to make up 
the theory of consciousness. I am partial to some of them and not so partial to others. But I find it very interesting that much of what we consider consciousness when we think of the sort of consciousness where we're self-aware and we are behaving consciously, that it uh, that first of all we have a model of ourselves, something that is very high level, where there really aren't any details involved. But at the same time, we're typically using working memory while that's going on. There's a correlation between working memory being active and us being consciously aware. A strong one. And this, this method that working memory has for using the temporal dimension as a way to connect things that can be across the entire brain, but they are active at the same time. So temporally, they are part of the same pattern. And then you have another thing that is temporally the part of the same large pattern across the entire brain. It's interesting to me how that can accomplish this integration effect that we imagine is important for consciousness. So this, this notion that you can pull all these different things into your model of your own self being here, doing something at this time. Um, so I don't really know what consciousness is, obviously, but I, I have my suspicions about what is included, what's not so much included, which processes are involved. I really like focusing on the processes rather than the areas because I don't see consciousness or being conscious and aware as a static snapshot, not really a state. It's so when people say a state of consciousness, I find that a little bit deceiving, a little bit of an illusion in the sense that it's not, you can't have just a snapshot brain and that snapshot is conscious. It's a process. So it's about mm -hmm. some ongoing process that's there. And, and importantly, when we think of being aware of something or making the judgment that I just experienced this, I just felt that, these judgments have to be based on, for example, making comparisons. You can only make a judgment if you're making a comparison, if you're carrying out some kind of an operation. That means you've already put something in a variable. In other words, everything you're doing when you're carrying out a conscious operation like an awareness is post hoc. It's in the past. It's not really right now in the present. Most of that has already been done. You've processed most of it. And then you're just carrying out some final bit of computation and using that output for something. Anyway, this kind of gets into almost philosophy because it really it kind of connects to this whole notion of thinking of ourselves and our, our being there and what our mind does as from this, I guess, from this functionalist philosophy, really, rather than a philosophy that looks at which part or which biological component or what piece of matter, how, like, is it this kind of a transmitter or that kind of a transmitter? It's very funny to think about those things too, because neurotransmitters in a mammalian brain will be inhibitory, happen to be excitatory in a fruit fly brain. So it's not really that it is that transmitter. It's just being used for a certain purpose. So it's this, this whole functionalist thing. But that's probably really more Keith's domain because Keith has got a lot more experience in philosophy than I do. Oof, I... Not... <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> uh, Sorry to put you on the spot there. <laughs> so I'm going to agree with Randall insofar as I'm going to not stick my flag in the sand either. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I haven't been staying on top of it either, except that, uh, you know, just in the last month, it was brought to my attention that Robert Lawrence Kuhn had released the paper, a landscape of consciousness toward a taxonomy of explanations and implications. Um, it's 140 pages long, so I haven't really gotten very far through it yet, but anyone who's interested in the current state of the art of the, you know, the total sort of uh availability of theories on consciousness might want to check that out and um i certainly intend to as well so yeah that's that's pretty much all i'm going to say about consciousness right now cool mm -hmm. no worries yeah well um randall is there any um you and interesting things which uh carbon copies are focusing on right now that you'd like to discuss um, yeah, sure. Um, actually, I want to give a very quick overview of the things that Carbon Copies does, just so that you know where it fits in. 
Um, mm. Carbon Copies is a nonprofit that really has two branches. One of them is educational and the other one is research oriented. The educational one is all about trying to teach people what whole brain emulation or brain emulation actually is, what it's about, why you would care, to get into the details, to turn it from something that would seem like a sci-fi topic to something that people can actually understand where it fits in, for example, for students at universities, so they have some idea where that fits into neuroscience or psychology, cognitive science, and so forth. Then on the research side, uh, we have a few main topics going on right now. One of them is the update of the whole brain emulation roadmap. This roadmap was originally made all the way back in 2008. Then there were several attempts to update it in between. And then last year, there was almost a really good start at doing so, but the funding for it fell through briefly. Now it's back in our, our corner here. And so we're taking that where it should go with the help of Andrew Sandberg, who of course was instrumental in creating the original one. Then we have a topic where we're trying to wrap our heads around the ethics of whole brain emulation. So we're trying to understand on a timeline from here to a point where whole brain emulation exists as a real thing. How does that affect patients? How does it affect society? And what should researchers be aware of? So, for example, as you're doing experiments and you're creating emulations of things or you're working with animals to learn how to make emulations of brains, are there things you should be considering? So that's that's something we're trying to wrap our minds around a little bit because, you know, we're looking over at the field of AI and we see how it had this sudden acceleration of output and then a lot of consideration of the ethical implications gets tacked on sort of almost as an afterthought where companies are rushing in to have an ethics group and then maybe sometimes when the ethics group complains about something or makes you aware of something then they're a little bit unhappy about that they're not quite sure what to do with it so we thought why don't we start early here instead just have a look at that landscape and try to come up with a framework and then finally the part of the research that i think i spend about 85 percent of my time caring about at the moment is this project that we're calling the Brain Emulation Challenge. Because as we, we talked about earlier, right now, the, the biggest challenge, this biggest hurdle still in front of us is to try to translate the data that we acquire, all that brain data, into parameters that go into a model. And you need ways to learn how to do that. And then I, I briefly talked about C. elegans as an animal model that can help because it's ground truthable. You can, you can in principle, know as much as you need to know about it to be able to make that translation happen. But it's not as easy in other areas, in other parts of the brain, in of other animals, animals that are larger, like humans. And so one of the things that's typical when you're a modeler and you're trying to make a model that works and you don't just want to build a crazy complicated model, press go, and then see that it's sitting there dead, not doing anything, or it seems to be epileptic, and you have no idea why. Where's the error? What's wrong? One of the problems there is that, okay, if you're trying to just build something complicated, uh, you don't have enough of a sort of a, an iterative stepwise approach to getting there. And you can't easily discover where your methods are failing. That's why in AI, for example, when you do that, um, you often work with data sets that are already well known, fully understood, like a, a big set of images that have been annotated and you know exactly what they are or a virtual landscape in which you try to train your automatic driving algorithms before you throw them out on the open road. And so this attempt to make this so-called brain emulation challenge is an attempt to, to provide a platform like that, a platform that can generate synthetic data, but then in future also data created with cultured neurons in, on top of electrodes. So two types of data where we have a lot of laboratory control about exactly what's in it, how difficult it is, which variables we include, which ones we don't include, and make it make the problems from easy to hard, and then allow everyone, everyone out there, university, not university, doesn't matter, to participate and to use their best ideas, their best algorithms to work with our synthetic data, our virtual pieces of brain tissue with virtual recordings of electromicroscopy, recordings on electrodes or calcium imaging, what have you, 
take those data sets and try to reconstruct what's in there. Give us back the function that is actually inside this thing. And we know everything about this thing because we created it. So it's fully known ground truth. And then that way, get better at it. And we've seen in AI, for example, that you have these annual competitions where people will take their algorithms and they'll challenge each other. Basically, they'll try it out and they'll see, okay, I'm getting 85% correct on this data set, 95% correct. And so people will put in a lot of investment, sometimes for no prize at all, and sometimes for prizes that are much, much smaller than the cumulative investment of all the people participating. And that's what we're trying to do to grow this field. Um, I might have mentioned it earlier, I don't remember, but there is currently a very, very small number of labs that are directly looking at the problem of this translation. Uh, the ones that are really using data that comes straight out of a connectome and are trying to work with that, I can probably count them on one hand. So I would love to see that field grow. And that's why I think that a challenge like this is really useful. So we've gotten to the point now where we have the basic platform and we're able to start generating artificial data based on these uh, these networks that we grow. Um, if you want, we can do another call at some point where I'll just show you that because there's a whole bunch behind that and uh, some really nice <laughs> 3D. Again, 3D is always nice to watch. 3D images mm -hmm. like fly throughs where you can see what's going on when we generate these uh, these virtual tissue pieces. Um, yeah, so, so we're at the point where we now can start testing sort of end to end, make a virtual piece of tissue, collect data from it, make that data available, have someone try their hand at reconstructing what's there, and then close the loop, tell them what errors they made, tell them what their score was and where they went wrong. What pieces of structure did they find? What pieces of the function did they find? What might they have? not seen or may they have even confabulated things that aren't there just try to show them the errors that are there and, and improve that have that improvement loop appear um yeah that's the that's sort of like the main focus of carbon copies at the moment hmm. fascinating yeah it's, it'd be awesome to be able to achieve that um you recently had a conference uh, like an online conference and Anta sandberg keith randall and a few others gave a talk. Uh, yeah, how'd that go? Uh, yes. That was an attempt right. to present scenarios where there might be an ethical situation, something that you should consider. And we had panelists um, think those through and talk about them. And, and that was, uh, yeah, that was very fruitful in the sense that we collected a lot of useful insights that we might not have thought about ourselves. And that now uh, Mirinda James, who is the main person working on the ethics framework part for us, she's, uh, she's going through that and trying to collect what we've learned and then start putting that into our ethics framework, or at least the first version, a draft of it. Keith, uh, have you got any projects that you're working on recently? Um, other than the book, of, obviously mm -hmm. we've done an interview on your wonderful yeah. book, Contemplating Oblivion. I, so I, I wrote it and then I was working on the self-publishing of it. And then once that was done, I still wasn't done because then I was aggressively promoting it for at least its first month, which culminated two days ago. That was sort of the end of the first month. Um, so I guess things are sort of slowing down a little bit because I've just sort of run out of ideas for what my next big promotional push is. So um, the book is sort of moving into its next phase as is sort of my life. Um, what am I working on? So my, my day job is in, um, you know, the sorts of EM brain scanning that we discussed earlier. So I'm, I'm just sort of continuing to sort of, um, you know, make my very small nudge uh, forward in the totality of human knowledge that will sort of enable the next generation of brain scanning technology. Um, other than that, I'm not sure if I have projects that are sort of, uh, you know, sort of in this domain. Um, I'm, I'm always uh, sort of trying to figure out how I can contribute to carbon copies. Um, there are some very interesting projects there. The Brain Gen X project is probably the most tantalizing. Um, yeah, I'm not, 
don't know. Uh, I'm also sort of in close contact with the Brain Preservation Foundation folks. Um, but uh, I wouldn't say that I've got a project going on there either. Um, I don't know. Well, have you got any um, updates on what BPF are up, up to? Uh, they the Brain Preservation to, Foundation. Yes, they have. So, um, you know, a few in the in the recent sort of you know ten years, they had run a series of X Prize style cash prizes to motivate the development of brain preservation methods. Um, the winning method was ASC aldehyde aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation, uh, spearheaded by Robert McIntyre. Um, uh, that won a series of awards. There was there was a PPF award for preserving a rabbit, and then subsequently for preserving a pig brain um, with verifiable and peer-reviewed published results. Um, after that, they started the the BPF. Uh, basically attempted to design a new set of such awards uh, to advance other areas of, um, of sort of preservation um, advancement. Um, I'm not too keen on the details. I, I, I attend the meetings, but I actually don't take too much part in the planning meetings. So um, I don't have anything to say about that, unfortunately, right now. Yeah, but they're they're still there. They're they're basically designing the mm. next round of prizes and awards and and figuring out their next set of projects. Uh, I think some of what the BPF is interested in is sort of uh, socio political advocacy, just trying to get people and politicians and the law, and you know, and hospitals and and sort of end of life sort of uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, to sort of come around to the possibility of brain preservation as a an option that that should be ethically and legally available to individuals. Um, so there's a lot of uh, sort of thought in that space. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the sort of thing that they're trying to uh, advance, along with the you know the technical uh, advancement of a pr actual process. What sorts of people do you think could have an impact? Uh, and if they want to get involved, how can they get involved? You're asking me? Yeah, I'm asking both of you. I'm talking about the general field, not just the Brain Preservation Foundation, not just carbon copies. If they wanted to have an impact on the types of research that might feed into so, sort of uh, aligned goals of yeah. Brain Preservation Foundation and carbon copies. Um, yeah, so um, good communicators can be very, very useful because uh, first of all, our sort of the visibility of, of whole brain emulation and all related things as a whole isn't that great. And it's, there are still a lot of confusion around it as well. Um, carbon copies, brain preservation, both of those are of course always struggling with their own visibility, with their own communications in a sense. So I think that's a very important one. And then anyone who has experience with or wants to gain experience in helping with fundraising because funds for things that are more directly related to work in either brain preservation or brain emulation is sometimes difficult to come by if you can't make the argument that it directly helps with, for example, solving Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease if you're not directly associated with one of the big research institutions out there. Uh, this is going to change eventually when, for instance, um, Let's say, let's, let's just assume for a moment that the brain emulation challenge becomes popular and that labs like Conrad Cordings with his C. elegant stuff or others participate in it. And so then it becomes something that people see and more people come in from there. Then you get more labs that are working directly on the problem. And because those PIs themselves are also the reviewers for grants at the NSF and the NIH, Right, so they're the, they're the reviewers of those grants. They decide what is worth giving funding to, what types of research receive funding. You then get out of this, this difficult situation. So you get to a place where the kinds of work that really helps us get over the hurdles 
can directly receive the funding for the sorts of initial experiments, initial work that otherwise might have a difficult place to find a home. But right now there are still many of these sort of maybe somewhat idiosyncratic things that people have to do that don't really fit into the the narrative that's been created around what are valuable types of research. Um, they need to find a home and and fundraising for those is difficult. So that's something where there's a lot that can be done. So I think that anyone with a background that could fit into that could also find plenty to do. But then of course, yeah, researchers, if you're interested in any of this research, either on the computational side, as a machine learner, or as a programmer, or if you are a neuroscientist, or something related to that, there's always plenty to do. And then of course, something like brain preservation will require very different skills than, than computational neuroscience, the kind of thing that, you know, we're focusing on over here. Fascinating. Yeah. I, I thought that there would have been quite a, uh, an, a surge of interest when Kurt Skazart did their video on mind uploading. Did you notice uh, an increase in interest was, around that time? An uptick. And, uh, and in fact, um, some of the best people, some of the best young people that we have currently on our brain emulation challenge project got interested in us and in what we're doing because of the Kurtzkas Act video. Wow. So it did have a, a fantastic influence, really. These sorts of things mm. are important, more important than, you know, us mere researchers would normally think. Well, thanks very much, guys, for joining us here on the channel. Uh, I can see you're, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating field and there's plenty to do. If you, uh, I'll open up this space to any concluding remarks or anything that you might have felt was left unresolved in some of the conversations we had earlier. Uh, yeah, Keith or Randall, jump in. Well, I don't think been... anything was really left unresolved. It's just that there were maybe a thousand other topics we could have gotten into, of course, everything from mm. philosophy to God, whatever. Yeah. I didn't necessarily yeah. mean God specifically. I was just saying that as an expletive. No, it was a, it was a great conversation. Um, um, it's always a pleasure to talk about these things, and uh, especially with the two of you who I've known for many years. Um, I will make one more plug. <laughs> Uh, for, for Contemplating Oblivion, which mm. is a novel. Um, you just find it on Amazon or anywhere else if you're interested. But, uh, you know, short of that, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's good for us to all sort of check in and um, remind ourselves, remind everyone else kind of that this is out there and it's moving forward and uh, some of us are believers in it. Yeah, and come and mm. visit us over at carboncopies.org. Just got to plug that mm -hmm. URL there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much, guys. Um, I look forward to chatting to you both about this again in, in the near future.